talk high school football, 4A, 3A, and 2A in Texas. We talk East Texas sports. We talk NFL, guy talk, movie, and booze. We also talk wrestling and so much more. So like and subscribe and check us out. Hey, everybody. What's going on? This is Kenny Heath, Central Texas Football Podcast, coming to you live from the worldwide headquarters in Huron, Texas. And joining me today is Terry. Hey. Hey, Terry. <laughs> I got thrown off by the logo. Terry, what's up, buddy? How you doing today? You can tell you can tell we're at that point of the season. There's an ebb and flow to it. We get really excited. And then about week eight of the season till about week 10, we're all just struggling to make through. And then the playoffs revitalize us. But, hey, at least we have some really fun games to talk from last week and to talk this week. Some, of course, we'll talk about what I guess some are calling the big upset. You and I kind of talked about it two weeks ago that, you know, Italy was a team you had to be careful to watch. But before we do that, you always have the great Matt Stepp question of the week. Yeah, speaking of actual Italy, uh, so this was for last week, but we're going to ask it this week since we didn't have a show. So it feels like Region 2 and 2AD1 is getting stronger each week with the emergence of undefeated Hamilton and Mildred. Tough teams such as Kearns, Italy, Wolf City, Tioga, and Ballinger. Uh, is Axel still the favorite, or is this region wide open? And Step says he, you know, this is last week before the upset, so uh, you know, give him a little bit of leeway. But he's he's still on the fence here. Axel is the favorite in a wide open region, but he's still kind of scared about that playoff disappointment last year. You know, Axel going the dreaded ten and one, so uh, he's still got Axel. What about you? You know, th this is so open. I, I definitely think you, you can't look at the uh, the loss, and we'll get into it here, and that's probably where we'll lead off at since it kind of blends into this question. But, you know, you, you can't look at that loss and just completely dismiss Axtell, but it does bring up the thing that you and I have talked about, and, and he brought it up, you know, as far as last year. You know, they were extremely hot, one of the hot teams. I remember we talked about it on the playoff preview show that – you know, we thought they were going to navigate the region and, and be there at the end. And then Valley Mills beats them in the first round uh, and, and beat them 29 to 18. If I remember correctly, I think Mills had like 250 yards rushing and, and they basically just ground down Axel. And that's kind of like what Italy did this week. So, I, yes, they're in the favorites. I think Italy is in the favorite. I think Hamilton is in the favorites. I think Mildred is a team that people need to look out for as they've kind of resurrected their program over the last few years as the Eagles right now. You know, they're 7-0. and oh. uh, They're in a district where Price Carlisle is extremely down this year. Uh, they've actually been down for two years now, ever since uh, – Clay Baker went to Henderson, and, and look at what he's doing over in Henderson in 4A in East Texas. Uh, so, I mean, I think you said it best. This region is wide open. There is not, in my opinion, a prohibitive favorite right now. Yeah, I, I'm kind of, you know, Axel uh, was probably thinking they were the favorite early on, but it is wide open, and it was wide open at the beginning of the year. You know, they split those Waco schools up, so traditionally – these schools would be grouped up with a, a Crawford and until this year, a Toller. Uh, but yeah, I like, I like Hamilton. I like Italy. I like Axel. I like Mildred. I think it's going to be a fun one to keep an eye on. And, and to be fair, let's go back to district six and, 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 you know, Wolf city who beat Timpson a few weeks ago. Now Timpson of course is not Timpson of old Timpson lost last week to Shelbyville, but Shelbyville I think is now a region three division one favorite. Um, but you look at Wolf City, they had to come back on Tom Bean last week, 28 to 27, a little bit disconcerting because Tom Bean themselves are very down. But when you got, you know, Wolf City, you've got White Wright, you've got Alvord, uh, and then Tioga, you know, everybody is kind of forgetting about District 6. They're, they're kind of the weird group in this area as far as where they are placement wise in the state of Texas. Um, but so you, let, let's just go, let, let's do it like this. We're going to expand on what step talked about. All right. So we're going to go district by district. Of course. And if you don't know, we now with division split, you have four districts per region. Yeah. So in region two district five, it's Ballinger, Bangs, Coleman, De Leon, Hamilton, and Heiko. I, I think we all believe that Heiko is the bell cow and, and the prohibitive best team of that district. Hamilton. Yeah, Hamilton, the Bulldogs. Um, they're seven and zero. Oh, no one else is even close. De Leon is four and three. They're two and zero oh in district, though. And, and I will, I do want to point out that De Leon's three losses are to Stanford, to Holly, and to Munster. Three really, really good teams. 
but none of them have been close. So the, hey, you've played a good team factor gets kind of lost if you get the doors beat off of you. But yeah, you do yeah. have to at least put of note, they're going to go in, I'm going to assume they're going to be the second place team uh, in the district, and they're going to play a, a third place team that, you know, they're going to be like, hey, we've played five teams better than them. So I, I could see De Leon playing for, for a little while, but I still think Hamilton's the favorite. In District 6, again, Alvord, Nakona, Tioga, Tom Bean, Trenton, White, Wright White, and Wolf City. Honestly, I feel that this district, as far as the amount of playoff teams, has the best chance of, of multiple teams playing really far in this region. If that makes sense, yeah. I mean, I, I haven't studied on that, that district, but I, I agree with it. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, because so when you look at it, you got Wolf City at at, at uh, six and one; they're three and zero. Oh. You've got Tioga at five and two; they're three and zero. Oh. But again, go look at who Tioga's lost to: Collinsville undefeated, Lone Oak undefeated. That's their two losses, uh, and and they were competitive. Though the scores got out of hand, they were competitive in both of them. Alvord is the team that I have the biggest curiosity of because they're zero and four going into district. But again, they lost to Valley View, they lost to Lindsay, they lost to Archer City, and they lost to Winthorst. Three of those four teams are playoff teams. Two of those four teams could probably play two or three rounds in the playoffs. And then since they've gotten in district, uh, they've beaten the Kona, Trenton, Tom Bean, and Tioga. I mean, uh, White right, so it's Tioga and Wolf City for Alvord. And if Alvord wins one of those two, they're second place. If they win on both, they're district champs. But it, to me, Alvord, Tioga, or Wolf City, all three can play for a pretty pretty good uh, time, a long time in this region because this region, it's open for a reason because it's extremely deep with a lot of teams that are all at the same level. If that makes sense, I got you. And, and then of course, District Seven. I still think Axel and Italy are the, the 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 bell cows, and then district district eight's the interesting one again. Mildred's taking the reins, but I mean, you know, Frankston has not played the worst schedule in the world. Uh, they're one of those teams that they always have athletes. They always will. When you look at them, you go, "Man, why is that team not winning more?" And it's consistency. Every time you think they finally figured it out, they they struggle. But again, they're sitting in a prime playoff spot at one and one. You've got Kearns, and we talked about Kearns uh, earlier this year. You know, they're a team that has got a lot of talent. They took Axel to the mat. I think it was 16 to 14. Uh, Brent Watkins, who was the defensive coordinator over at Malakoff, he's now the head coach there. Um, and, and so Kearns is a team, man, if they get into the playoffs, you don't want to play. And, and that's why this region is so fun. Yeah, Kearns got a really good quarterback. He's real athletic, fun to watch. And uh, you're right about the Axel game. That was a kind of a, a wake-up call for him, maybe. Yeah, it really was. So, so let's go ahead and talk about Axel versus Italy. You know, Axel scores first seven to nothing in the first quarter. It's a defensive sh uh, matchup through the most of the rest of the game until the third quarter. And then Italy woke up. They scored 21 unanswered points. Uh, Garrett Wood threw for 61 yards in the interception. Not great, but more importantly, he ran for 186 yards on 21 carries, had a 93 yard touchdown to seal the deal. Uh, and I mean, you know, Axel just could not get physical enough when they needed in that second half. Yeah, he the Jared Woods got some wheels. I watched some of his tape from uh some other games, and, and you know, he doesn't look like he's got blazing speed, but he'll break three or four tackles and he's gone. Nobody's nobody's catching him. He did it to Rio Vista when they uh, had to pick the kick six. Uh, he's just a yeah. really, I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, his throwing right. is kind of not real consistent but the dude can run the football yeah i i totally forgot about he was part of the kick six so i mean italy's kind of putting together a little bit of a magical run right here getting a 93 yarder uh in, in this game a kick six to win the game in the other one uh and man you know sometimes you know that's that's the fun part of football is you just a, a team that's good gets on a better than good streak and weird things happen. Everything breaks for them. Right. And, and all that. So, you know, I, I know people want to focus on the Axel side of this, but for me, I, I think this is just more about what Italy did right and how solid this Italy team is. They don't really have anything that stands out like, Oh my God, that's what we've got to stop except for maybe Jared Wood, but he's proven that, Hey, okay. If you stop him for half the game, it, you're going to have to keep stopping him. So I know a lot of people are focused on the Longhorns on this loss. They were state ranked, blah, blah, blah. Give me Italy and the credit to the Gladiators, though. That was just a fun, important win for them. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, and you were talking about uh, 
those teams up north, you know, having a chance to, for a couple of them to make a run. I yeah. think Italy and Axel is kind of in that same group. I think that, you know, Axel's got to prove some things, but I think they've got the playmakers. They don't have the size, but they've got the speed and the playmakers to do something. And, and I think as long as you've got that quarterback, Jared Wood, on your team, you've got a chance if you're Italy. And let's not forget, there's a there's a greater than zero chance that these two teams could match up again in the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Again, with with this these four districts, I mean, you, you look at just all of two A Division One and Region Three has a lot of confusion, but because there are so many really good teams, maybe not a great team, but really good teams in it. Uh, region Four feels kind of set. It's going to be Refugio and Ganado. Uh, region One is going to be really, really interesting, of course, because you've got Holly and they feel like they're the the king of the region right now. But then you've also got uh, you know, you still got Post, who's surprisingly undefeated. Uh, you've got Cisco, who Holly plays this week. And then you've got Region 2. And as we say, I mean, I, there's four teams that could win this region, in my opinion. Add another two that if things get right, they could get hot. They could also uh, win district. So, you know, again, we, we lead with 2A Division One, Region 2 a lot. And it's because of how exciting it is. But like, talking about exciting, let's move over to... You know, you called them early, man. I will give you credit. All the way from the preview show, one of the first questions you asked me kind of took me aback a, a little bit. You're like, how good can Robinson be? And I'm like, well, I mean, it's Robinson. Outside of, like, one state championship appearance, they're usually going to struggle. And yo, lo and behold, the Rockets just keep on winning. They do it again, beating a really good Conley team, 42-29. to 29. Evan Moreno goes off. He had 188 yards. Uh, I think he had 7.2 yards a carry. At one point, he was at 9.4 yards a carry. Uh, as a team, they rushed for 295 yards. Uh, I'm telling you what, to, to, to manhandle a very big Conley defensive line is pretty impressive. Yeah, Coach Lancaster was doing a hell of a job. He did a good job at Little River Academy, where he, you know, and he was offensive coordinator at Troy. Uh, tweeted out that I thought Conley was going to win this game, and uh, <laughs> I was wrong, and I got retweeted quite a bit for that, which is fine. I'm glad Robinson won. Uh, I like Coach Lancaster. We've had him on the show. We talked. I talked to him before the season. Uh, he doesn't text. I was like, hey, text me what you think. He's like, I don't text. So we called and talked about it. Uh, yeah. Evan Marino is a big surprise because, you know, he didn't – he wasn't the starter at the beginning of the year. I think uh, Knight got hurt early on, and he came in in that Glenrose game and just went off, and he really hasn't looked back since. Bryce McCurdy can really spin the ball. I think he had like 140, 170 yards pass in that game. Uh, really held a con the defense. Let's talk about the defense. Uh, yeah. Held a, a really dynamic Conley offense with Jamarian uh, Vincent, who can score from anywhere on the field. To 29 points, what well, doesn't look great, but Conley can score. And uh, I think I read in the paper where Robinson scored on every possession in the second half. So kind of, you know, uh, muddy the waters there the first half and the second half found their groove. Really impressive win with Robinson uh, for Robinson against Conley, which sets up a great game this week. Yeah, and so that's going to be the question for Robinson. Can they do it back-to-back -back weeks? Playing La Vega this week, and of course, La Vega – uh, the, the, their quarterback is, is growing. He's maturing. He's not making quite as many mistakes as he did in the pa past year. And he's only a sophomore, so that's going to happen. Yeah. You've got Bryson Rowland, who is, I, I still think, maybe the best running back in Class 4A Division II outside of Carthage's running back. I think they're neck and neck. Uh, I, I think the thing about Rowland that hurts him is his, his height. He's got size at 190, and he's fast to be 190, and he's compact. But the problem is at the at the next level, they don't like compact, not 5'6 compact. There's this real weird misconception. People think that players are more injury prone because they're smaller, and, that, and that's just not a thing. Like you're not injury prone because you're five six, and if you were six foot, you wouldn't be injured. That's not a thing. I, I, it's like cramps. I, I still to this day, you'll somebody will get cramps, and you'll hear, "Oh, they need to condition more." Cramps have nothing to do with conditioning. Cramps are a hundred percent if you're hydrated. That's it. Hydrated. You can be the the biggest slob and never work out, but as long as you're hydrated before you go work out and play a football game, you're not going to cramp. It's the same thing with size. So Roland gets a knock as far as the next level because he's only five six. I think he's closer to five eight. I, I've stood around. I've stood next to him. I'm a I'm at six one, and he kind of feels about five eight. Uh, but the uh, results on the field speak for themselves. And, and this, it's weird to say this that. 
some people would look at this as La Vega as the underdog. I still look at them as the favorite in this game. When you look at who they've played, losing to Salina, losing to West Orange Stark, losing to Stephenville, three teams that uh, combined two losses, and those two losses were Stephenville to Ruston, which is basically like a college football team, and, and then West Orange Stark losing by one point to Nederland, a really good 4A team out in southeast Texas, or 5A team out in southeast Texas. I like Robinson. I think Robinson is going to be a force in the playoffs in a really tough region. But in this game, I still like the experience and the overall offensive talent of La Vega. I'm going to hold my pick until uh, we get there. Uh, I just can't see, see me picking against Robinson <laughs> again this year. Not in district, but uh, they've proven me wrong a couple of times. So I, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to hold to Robinson. Hey, let's go to 5-3 AD1. Uh, Grandview and Grossbeck, what turned out to be a, a pretty good little barn burner. Uh, Grandview 36, Grossbeck 34. I didn't watch any film on that game, but people that were there told me that uh, Grossbeck had a couple of touchdowns called back yeah. and, you know, could have won it. Uh, but that those don't count. You know, it, it doesn't matter, you, you know, what happened. Uh, the final score is 36, 34. Surprisingly, you got Grandview and you got Maypearl at the top of that district, uh, 2-0 and apiece. Uh, Grossbeck, Whitney at the bottom at 0-2. And then May, and then uh, Mahaya West there in the middle at one and one. Uh, that's a tough district, man. And we, and we knew those were going to be uh, wins were going to be at a premium in that district. Probably not shaking out how we thought it was going to shake out, but it is what it is. Well, let's go ahead and l- let's talk the Grandview Grossback game, and then we'll melt it into the May Pearl Grandview. Uh, game this week because they play each other you, you, you talk about gross back they're zero two one of the best zero and two in district teams in the state of texas and they're still a team that i think you know they they have a playoff story to tell now they're going to play west this week uh and, and that's going to be a tough one because west you know is doing west things but in saying that west is one and one you know that they, they lost to may pearl 14 to 6 they beat mahaya 7 to 6 so west this year defensively is perfectly fine offensively it is where the Trojans are really, really struggling this year. Uh, when you look at who they've played, you know, they, they scored 21 against Robinson, 10 against Hillsboro, six against May Pearl, and again, beating Mahaya, a very, very good uh, Mahaya team that I think will make the playoffs as well. But it's going to come down to Mahaya, uh, Grossbeck, and West. Trent Platt for uh, Grossbeck did everything he could last week. Uh, against Grandview, he, he I think he threw for 112 yards and two touchdowns. He ran uh, for 89 yards, uh, and uh, also Jordan Smith, a sophomore, ran for 160 yards. But dude, at this point, Grandview is doing what good teams do. This is not the best Grandview team in the last five or ten years, but man, they have started to figure it out in district, and they've come up with a three point win against Whitney. And a two-point uh, win against Grossbeck. Now you can make the case that you know Grossbeck and Whitney are combined zero and four in district, but they've all been competitive games. I do have to ask you though: Can Whitney get out of this 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 tailspin they're in? Uh, I think they can. Uh, they've got you know. You look at their games. You know they. I think the problem for them is that offense is just stagnant for the first half of the game. You know, you look at Grandview. First half of the Grandview game, first half of the May Pro game, they scored seven total points. Uh, their quarterback was three for 12. His first 12 attempts against Grandview, two for 12 against May Pearl, roughly somewhere around there. And they they didn't get going until the second half, and they go and outscore uh, Grandview in the second half, and they outscore uh, May Pearl 21 to six, seven in the in the second half. They've just got to find a way to well, two things. They got to find a way to get that offense going early, obviously. And, you know, they just got to find a way to make a stop. That defense has got to make a stop late in the game. You know, they, they've had the lead late in both those games, and the defense just couldn't come back and, and, and make a stop. You know, they, they were up by a and they go down and score to take the lead against Maypro and just need the defense to make a stop, and, and they can't do it. So uh, they've got a couple of things to work on. I think Coach changes from what I, I have. His interview is after this, uh, after we record this, I'll talk to him. I don't know that he'll go into particulars, but I think he's making a few changes and try to rejuvenate, uh, you know, this team. I, the, obviously, they they got the the talent to win these two games. They they barely lost them, so they. I don't think they're totally out of the playoffs, but I really think this is a must win game against Maya this week. They're oh yeah, it, game, it, so it's obviously yeah, I mean, a must win game. 
I mean, to be fair, depending on what happens the last three games, every game's a must win. You, you can't have three yeah. district losses and, and make the playoffs in this district. And we talked about this district in the preseason uh, show with sideline to sideline. You and I have talked about it, of course, basically every week, but we talked about at the beginning of the year that this was going to be one of those districts that it's going to be week to week who are the best. As great as Grandview and May Pearl have started, obviously they play this week. We'll blend into that now. One of them will lose, and I still – think every team will have a loss before the district season's over. Um, Grandview's 2-0, May Pearl's 2-0, Mejia's 1-1, West is 1-1, uh, Grossbeck is 0-2, Whitney is 0-2. Um, th- there's not an easy win in this in this uh, rest of the season for anybody. Um, I-, I still am concerned about West is, West's offense. Whitney just kind of feels like they're still kind of licking their wounds about the injury. You got to move past that. Dare I say... May Pearl is the most complete team at the moment. And I don't even know if they're really complete, but compared to everybody else, May, May Pearl seems to have the least amount of questions right now. Yeah, May Pearl's really big up front. They they block well. Uh, they've got a quarterback that can spin it. They're running back R.J. Washington's got some top-end speed. He's a burner. They've got receivers that can catch the ball. Their defense uh, shut out Whitney in the first half, uh, you know, they're a good ball club. You know, this isn't last year's May Pearl that got beat 70 something to 20 by Whitney. This is a better, way better ball club. Uh, Grandview, man, they've got some dudes that can run number five and number zero, uh, Dominguez. And I forgot number five's name, but man, they, they, they really run the ball well. Uh, the quarterback, they call him Peanut. He can, he kind of picks and chooses his spots and, and he can do well when he has time. Uh, this is going to be a good one. Uh, I don't know. They're playing at Grandview. Uh, I'm going to give the nod to the Zebras in this one, I believe. I'm going to go with May Pearl. Uh, I, I do think the one thing you bring up is they're not last year's May Pearl. Uh, this is a team that is either bad or seven and four. That always seems to be their ceiling. If they can understand that they're better than that this year, I think the sky's the limit for them. Um, but there is that mental block of its Grandview. Uh, you know, we've talked about that with Whitney. Whenever Whitney goes to Grandview, for whatever reason, they can't win, whether it be because they're the uh, team that's not as good or even when they're better, it's just mentally when you step on the field with a team like Grandview and you've been beat by them so many times, you're almost down 14 to nothing before you start the game. So if May Pearl can get past that, mindset i think that they're i think they're legitimately the better team i'm gonna stick with may pearl but everything you say i, I think is 100 percent right as far as grandview has i think grandview can win the game because just mentally they they're they feel they're better than uh may pearl and i don't know if may pearl understands yet that they they may be as good or better than grandview yeah and you talk about every team uh you know, probably going to have a loss in this district. You know, Weston Grandview is a real big rival also. And, yeah. You know, the, the year that uh, – I think the first year Grandview won state, they went to West and West beat them. You know? Yep, and we were there. That, that's a big, you know, West, Whitney, Grandview. I wouldn't call Whitney Grandview a rivalry because Grandview just had the, the upper hand in that thing for a long time. West, Whitney's a pretty good rivalry. But, uh, yeah, that's – I kind of agree with what you're saying that, you know, probably everybody's going to have a loss in this in this district. All right, let's go to 5-3-A Division Two. You've got Toller versus Clifton this week. Uh, Clifton looks like they're doing their annual every five or six years. They have a really solid team. Uh, a few years ago, they were 9-3, and three, and then they were 8-4, and four, and then they went to crap for four years. Now they're back. Brett Finney uh, does a good job of you know winning with what he has. And this year, Clifton, they got a really good quarterback in Joaquin De La Hoya. They've got a solid running back in Brody Baggett. But... They're playing on a playing a Toller team that everybody has buried the Rattlers. They were already buried going into the season. Coming up from 2A, yeah, they played in the state championship game in 2A Division One, but Timpson had their way with them. Coach Jeremy Mullins moves over to Eagle Mountain. Uh, you know, they've lost a lot of great talent, including including one of the best backs in 2A Division One history, and Isaac Blessing. He was a joy to watch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they lose their first game to Peaster, ten to nothing, and then since then, Toller's been unbeaten and and and, and rolled off some pretty good wins beating Teague uh Tick 23 to 1 beating Comanche 14 to 7 uh shutting out early 56 to nothing and early's not great but early still competitive and they weren't in that game destroying Dublin last week who is not competitive this week they've got Clifton 
I think Toller rolls in this. I think people have very much underestimated the talent that's back on this team. Yeah, they lost Isaac Isaac Blessing, but they have 14 returning starters from that team from last year. A, a team that over the last three years was absolutely dominating in 2A Division One, and, and you still got Peyton Brown, who is one hell of a running back. Blake uh, Drake Owens, who is one hell of a running back. They have a good, solid, not big, but very physical, very active offensive line. Uh, they got a defense that swarms to the ball. I, I think the Rattlers are going to make a lot of noise in the playoffs this year. Yeah, and I agree with what you said. That's kind of why I put them on this little run sheet. Two reasons that, uh, you know, I think you're exactly right. People just buried Toller. They moved up to 3 AD2. Uh, probably didn't think, you know, they lost, like you said, Isaac Blessing. But, you know, don't forget, Peyton Brown, his freshman and sophomore year, was a workhorse. Yes, he was. For 1,600 yards and over 2,000 yards. Got hurt his junior year. Now he's back. Uh, yeah, I'm really, you know, I don't know what I expected out of Teller going up to 3 AD2. I don't know if I expect him to be uh, just a one loss to Peaster going into to this district game. And then you look at Clifton, kind of thought we'd throw them in there too because they've been successful. They're coming off two one-point wins, uh, doing what they have to do to win. And you're right, De La Hoya, he's a tough-as-nails uh, quarterback. He'll, he, he runs the ball quite a bit for him. Brody Baggett runs the ball. So I just wanted to throw this one in just to, you know, as a reminder that, uh, hey, you know, Teller's doing good things. Uh, Clifton's doing good things, but I agree. I don't know that it's going to be much of a game. I think Tiller kind of runs away with this one. Well, and, and, you know, this district gets lost inside this region. And to be fair, it's got some great teams in this region with Jacksboro, with Holiday, with Toller. Oh, with, it's tough, tough, tough. Huh? It's a tough one, tough region. Well, but the problem is, is you've got Gunner atop it. And, and so yeah. everybody just – circles in Gunter, which they're right. Gunter will probably win the region and probably won't be tested. But the battle to get to Gunter is going to be an absolute blast. It's going to be fun to see who gets to Gunner in that region final. And I think Toller is definitely one of those. Hey, let's stick in 3A Division two. I like that you put this one on the run sheet. Lexington uh, versus Blanco. The Panthers uh, look pretty in district. They're five, uh, two and zero. Oh. They're five and three overall. But I mean, solid losses. Losing to Hondo, losing to U, uh, UC uh, Randolph, who's a really good four A team. Though they got beat a couple weeks ago. Losing to a Yokum team that's a really hard team to play. But they've been kind of up and down. But a lot of that is because of the schedule they play. Going up against seven and zero, oh, number four in the state, Lexington. I saw Lexington a couple weeks ago. Uh, look. I, I like what the Panthers are doing. They're a tough team, but nobody in this district, maybe nobody in this region stays within three touchdowns of Lexington as long as they play their game and the Eagles stay healthy. Yeah, I think Coach Mills just got a a machine going over there in Lexington and the quarterback, uh, Evans, Case Evans, uh, and they've got other pieces uh, for sure. Uh, yeah, I just want to throw this one on. Later. You know, we didn't forget about Lexington, and it's kind of seemed like a, a decent district game. But, yeah, I think Lexington rolls for this. And, and I agree. I think they're probably the region favorite, and it's going to be fun watching them uh, march on towards the playoffs. I, I will say, though, out of District 14, you've got East Bernard, who's been solid. Uh, Rice Consolidated has been way better than what people think, though they've kind of come down to earth. Tidehaven is still Tidehaven. They're, they're, even though they did lose you know, one of the best running backs in the history of 3A last year to graduation, they're still really good. And then Vanderbilt Industrial, I, I know they, they, they replaced their coach in the middle of the season. I, I thought that unless there's something we don't know about going on, I thought that was kind of – mean because you knew Vanderbilt Industrial once they got out of that murderous row of a non-district schedule that they were going to be just fine in district and here we are they're 2-0 and in district they're just fine um, so I, I do think Lexington it, it's kind of like Gunter I think Lexington's the king of the region but you've got other teams around it that it'll be interesting to see who gets to Lexington in that uh, region final and I'll, I'll be honest it it just kind of feels like Gunter versus Lexington might be that that's where we're headed for the state championship. And if so, I am a hundred percent there for it because Lexington would be the biggest test for Gunner in the playoffs since they lost to Franklin a couple years ago uh, in that state, their state championship game. Yeah. That, I mean, I don't, I, I don't really look at region four that much, uh, but yeah, I, uh, I like that. I'll be there for that one. All right, where do you want to go next? Uh, well, let's talk about Marlin. So you got Riesel at Marlin uh, over there in Region 3 and 2A uh, D1. Marlin, I 
kind of think, is this where they're going to start making their push? They got a couple of, I guess you can call them quality losses, you know, lost to West, Honey Grove, uh, forgot their third loss, but uh, Lexington. And, and they're kind of on a, on a run here. And Riesel's coming off a win over, I forgot who they beat last week. Uh, it was a Rosebud lot who we yeah. thought might be uh, contending with Marlon. They beat Crawford last week, 21 to seven. They beat Rose lot two weeks ago, 21 okay. to 20. So Riesel's kind of didn't start out gangbusters, but they've got two uh, district wins. So do you think this is where Marlon kind of hits this different gear and, and they're going to, you know, head, you know, get ready for the playoffs? So I think they win this district. I just don't know what they do in the playoffs. I, I, I think, Maybe this is just the gear they are this year, but this gear is good enough to win this district and to play for a pretty good while in the in the playoffs. You know, three losses. If you, if we were doing the old school BCS, Marlin would be the team that's four and three, but still in the top ten. And everybody would be like, "Well, why?" Well, go look at who they lost to: losing to Lexington twenty-seven to twelve, losing to Honeygrove twenty-one to twenty in a game that Honeygrove was up twenty to or twenty-one to seven at one point, uh, losing to West twenty-one to seven. And we've talked about how good West defense is, and Marlin scored. Uh, I think the most points or second most points on the season against West. I don't know if they have a different gear. Maybe they do. Um, but I, I think no matter what, they definitely have a gear that's going to win this district. And I don't think that Riesel puts up much of a fight. And that's not a knock on Riesel. They have good wins as well. I just think Marlins on a different level. Gotcha. Uh, let's touch up on Lorena Con oh, Conley coming up. What do you – Lorena got that win against Gatesville. I, I kind of was thinking Gatesville would get that win. Uh, Conley's coming off a loss to Robinson. This is kind of a – this is a little seeding battle. You know, see who can uh, – I don't – I didn't look at uh, who they may get in the in the first round of the playoffs come second, third, or, you know, the seeding. But pretty important game for both teams. Well, and I mean, for Lorena, you know, they still – they still got work to do. And I, I technically the same for Waco Conley because, you know, they're one and one on the year. Um, but when you look at who they – each team plays next, I mean, Lorena, th this murderous row of, yeah, they're, they're you know, they're 0-2 in district. They've been competitive, but then they've got Conley. And then they've got China Spring. And then they got La Vega. And that China Spring game feels like it's setting up for winner of that game is your fourth place team. Because I do think Conley will take care of Lorena. Look, Lorena just – they picked the worst year to have to move up. That, that, it's just simple as that. Even if they were in 3A Division One in that region this year, they would have struggled. They would have been a playoff team. They still would probably be 8-2 and two and all that, but they would have struggled, and I don't think they would have had a lot, uh, a, a big run in, in 3A. I mean, when you lose Braylon Henry and Colin Hill and Jaden Porter and Caden Roberts and Wyatt Jones, and that's 95% of your offense last year. Uh, and and their defense has been really good this year, but they just haven't been able to find consistent play at quarterback. They haven't really been able to find consistency in their run game. Sometimes they'll look like gangbusters and they'll roll up 300 yards, uh, but then in that fourth quarter when they really need two first downs, they can't find it, and that's kind of what happened in that Gatesville game. And, and so I like Conley in this game, but again, as you and I talk about, as Grant and I talk about, Whenever you're ready to trust Conley, they lose to Athens. And so I, I'm still concerned about that. But just on pure football, I think Conley wins this game. And they might win it comfortably. Well, you know, and we this was one of our, I think, our preview question. You know, I think the two truths and a lie is like Yes. Uh Lorena or you know, or the or Robinson or Gates will make the playoffs. Cause and I agree with you, this was the absolute worst year because you knew. Lorena was losing a bunch of kids. You knew that uh, Gatesville had a really good running back, that they had a chance to do something, and you knew that uh, Robinson had Coach Lancaster there. We didn't know about Eli, uh, Evan Marino. We knew Bryce McCurdy played a little bit as a freshman, but we knew that Coach Lancaster does a great job, and uh, it's turned out to kind of be wide. I think Robinson – yeah, I guess your top three, Robinson, LaVega, Conley, probably locks, and then those – you know, China Spring, uh, who knows? I mean – China Spring Lorena may be left out of the playoffs. I don't, I don't, it's just going to be kind of crazy that fourth seed who gets it. And you and I said that when you did the two truths and a lie or two lies of truth, I can't remember which way it went. And we kept saying, well, everybody's, you know, uh, penciling in Lorena and China Spring, and this just ain't the year for that. No. Uh, now, I will say, if China Spring mentally is still connected, they have the best bet to go from 0 and 2 to a playoff spot. They have Gatesville this week. They have Lorena next week. They close out with Robinson. 
All three of those games are winnable games for China Spring. And yes, I know Robinson six and one. Yes, I know that. But again, there's history to this when it comes to high school football. And China Spring is going to look over at Robinson and have no fear. They're going to look over at them and be like, hey, we're about to slay the dragon. We're about to not only clinch a playoff spot, we're about to go to number two in the in the bracket. So, you know, for China Spring, I, st- I still think of the, of the teams that are from three to four, uh, six, if you're counting Gatesville, and Gatesville's the tough luck team, and we talked about that. This is a really solid Gatesville team. This is a Hornet team that, in a ton of other 4A Division II team uh, districts, they would make the playoffs. I mean, they've lost to La Vega 35 to 14. That was a seven point game in the third quarter, and then they lost to Lorena last week by three points, uh, two points. So, a Hornets team that again, they if they beat China Spring this week, they're thinking, hey, if we went out, we make the playoffs. This is why we said 12 4A Division II is. Is going to be an absolute blast, and it has turned out to be that exciting. Yes, sir. Man. All right. Dude, yeah, that's that's it, uh, now, uh, what about Westwood? Getting... Well, <laughs> that was that, kind of surprising coming down. I thought for sure it was going to be about the uh, TCU running back transferring over there until I read the story, and then I was like, oh, man. Yeah, it's it. They have it now. So if you don't know, Palestine Westwood, uh, a, a team that's came out of nowhere the last two years, scoring a ton of points uh, in a tough region. So even if they were to make the playoffs, I don't know how far they would go. But they were. They have a KV and Brian, a quarterback slash running back slash everything that does everything for Westwood, and that's the type of team you don't want to play in the playoffs. Well, their coach Richard Bishop got caught videotaping uh, hand signals while scouting you can't videotape anything while you're scouting you you can only write notes and and view um so they got he got suspended they have to forfeit every game prior to this but then the district committee i think overstepped and has now also said that they have to forfeit the rest of their games yeah i don't agree with that well there's a committee meeting tomorrow or the UIL appeal committee tomorrow and i my opinion what they will do is reinstate them to be able to play and still make the playoffs. Yeah. I think that's a little bit of an unfair overreach by the committee and, and if you don't know and you can shake your head at this night. And for anybody trying to say, "Oh, this is the U. This is a new team. The UIL don't want new teams to win. They want to make sure Columbus and Franklin win that region." This isn't the UIL. This is the district uh, executive committee, which is made up by coaches in the district. UIL does not have anything to do with this ruling until tomorrow when they hear the appeal. Um, so, you know, if Palestine Westwood has proof that hey, he didn't use it in every game, then maybe they even get some wins back. I don't think he will be – I think he'll stay suspended for the rest of the year. But I do think – and I do hope. I I genuinely hope that they give Palestine Westwood the chance to finish out the season. Because even if losing their their two district games, they can still make the playoffs, and they would still make the playoffs. And I think that's a little bit of the punitive part by the district executive committee. They're trying to completely knock them out of the thing, and, hey, we can reset with them out of the way. But I just – I don't think that's fair. I don't either. And I think the UIL, I mean, I can see forfeiting the games that you played and, like you said, suspend the coach, but I, I don't know why you would make them forfeit future games if they haven't done anything. You know, there's no cheating in future games. So I just don't. Maybe because maybe he's got video of it. I don't know. But if he's you not coaching, what? then you don't know. You, you bring up a good point that I actually didn't think about yesterday that might change that. If he's already videotaped future opponents. But couldn't you also just be like, okay, well, y'all know that now, so change your hands. Change your I don't know a coach. I don't know a coaching staff. I don't care what level you're at, six A down to pep, you know, prep little school, little league. I don't know a coach that keeps their signals 100 percent anyway from week to week. You're yeah. always changing it, not just because you think oh the other team, but because so in today's offense, especially especially in spreads. It's not like when we played where you just simply go out and say, okay, we're running a rip eight sweep or we're running 50 fly zone 23. Now it's you're using all these different concepts that you've practiced separately that maybe hasn't been a play together before. So like you've never ran the route where on the left side, your outside runs a post and your Z runs a, a what we call an inverted post. Some call it a sideline route, which is basically just a post to the sideline. Maybe you haven't used that before. So now you do it. So that's a completely different hand sign. But anyway, 
we'll see. We'll cut the, that'll be Thursday. I might even do a little bit of a, a live uh, reaction show to that here on the network. So be checking that out. Speaking of checking out, how can people find you on Facebook and on Twitter for Central Texas? Uh, go to Central Texas Football Podcast on Facebook and CTFP on Twitter. Uh, if you need to get a hold of me, just send me a message on those uh, two uh, social media platforms. Uh, where are you headed this week? Where are y'all going to watch? Oh, I've, I've actually have a – I'm on a bye week this week. Uh, this is already planned. Uh, Grant's headed out to Sunray, Texas to watch Panhandle versus Sunray in a big 2A matchup. He's excited. I really wish I could go. Um, that's one of those – Sunray – uh, has maybe or not maybe he will, will retire uh, when he graduates as the most prolific quarterback in 2A history and that's after Collinsville last year having Logan Logan Jenkins who was that for four years uh, Monday Luan is is absolutely magical Panhandle has a really good athletic team it's gonna be a great matchup that might be a preview of a region final those two teams easily could end up playing again uh, in the region final so that's where they're gonna be I'm gonna be at home just watching a bunch of games on YouTube. That'll be fun. Yeah, uh, Lujan reminds me of the kid that they had out in uh, Gerber. Where was he at? Littlefield? Or no, where was Gerber, the Gerber kid? Yeah, I know who you're talking about. But it was Littlefield, wasn't it? Tons yeah, of he's a little bit the same way. Luan's Level more, Land or Littlefield? One of the, yeah, I think, Level Land. I think it was Level Land. Um, but Luan's more of a – Luan reminds me more of like the old Texas Tech spread quarterback that the gets rid of the ball quick. They're going to throw some tunnel screens until you bring your safety up, and then they're going to pop that fake tunnel screen, and that guy that's been blocking the corner all game long is going to ole and go down mm -hmm. deep, and, and they'll just do that over and over until you figure out how to stop them, and so far nobody has been able to stop them. You can find uh, Sideline to Sideline on Twitter at Grant and Terry. You can like us on Facebook at Sideline to uh, Sideline. Just type that in. If you have any questions, just simply email us, Grant and Terry at S2S Sport, and I think that's it for week nine. That's right, next week. We'll be in week 10. That means we're three weeks away from the playoffs. The end of October. Next Friday is supposed to be fall football weather finally. Until next time, he's Kitty. I'm Terry. This has been the Central Texas Football Podcast on L4.